So I may enjoy beer, but I love cheese. So I thought, why not try and put the two together? Join me down the crafting and more rabbit hole as I show you how I made this stout infused cheddar cheese. So I've gone through a couple of cheese making phases in my life. When I tried it about five or six years ago, my first attempt was a flaming failure, so I gave up for a while. But it's something I've always been interested in, so I said, why not try it again? So I've made now about five different wheels of cheese. This stout infused cheddar is my fifth, and they've gone pretty well. So let me walk you through each of the steps to show you how I made this. The recipe for this cheese calls for two gallons of milk. I'm using whole milk picked up at my local grocery store. It's pasteurized, but not ultra pasteurized. Ultra pasteurized milk won't curdle quite right. Here's the full recipe for this cheese. Once all the milk has been added to the double boiler, I'll slowly bring the temperature up to 88 degrees. Once I get to the target temperature, I sprinkle the culture onto it, which I picked up from the cheesemaker company. I sprinkle it on and let it rehydrate for about five minutes before I stir it in. The job of this culture is to convert the lactose in the milk to lactic acid. After five minutes, I stir it into the milk, trying hard to stir it in a more up and down motion and not just spinning the milk around. I do this for a minute and then cover it and let it sit undisturbed for 45 minutes at 88 degrees. The double boiler does a good job at helping the milk to stay the target temperature here. Here we are at 45 minutes. The temperature of the milk is still good. Now I stir in the calcium chloride, which has been mixed into a quarter cup of cool water. This helps the curds to form better when the milk has been pasteurized. I stir this for a minute. Next, I add in the rennet, which has also been diluted into a quarter cup of water. The rennet is what causes the milk curds to form. The plan is to now let it sit covered for 45 minutes undisturbed and then to check to see if we have a clean break. So here you see at 45 minutes I took off the cover and I'm checking to see how well the curds have formed. You can see that they're actually not formed together really well right now. This is not what I'm looking for. So I had to wait another 10 minutes to see what it looked like. Well, another 10 minutes, it still wasn't quite ready. And so after an hour and 25 minutes, I finally got it to where it needed to be, where the spatula causes the curds to split when it's kind of pulled over and that's what we call a clean break. It's more important to follow what's going on with the milk than to blindly follow the recipe for this part. Now the first thing we need to do is gently cut the curds into smaller pieces. Different recipes call for different sized curds depending on how moist you want the final cheese to be. This particular recipe calls for cutting the curds into half inch cubes. I need to cut these in three different planes, top to bottom, across, and then also horizontally as well as I can. Now there are some special tools you can get to help with that horizontal part, but I haven't quite gone that far down this particular rabbit hole yet. Now the next thing to do is to slowly cook the curds to get them to express out more of the whey in them. You do this by raising the temperature up to 102 degrees over about 45 minutes, stirring regularly. You don't want to raise the temperature too quickly because that can cause the cheese to get a little bitter. And you have to stir it this whole time because if they start sticking together in this part, then they won't properly express out all the way that they need to. Here we are at about halfway through that 45 minutes and you can really see that the curds are starting to shrink down. Now the recipe tells me to let them sit at this temperature for about 30 minutes without stirring so that they'll start to knit together. Here we are after that 30 minutes and it's time to drain the whey off. I sanitized the sink before doing this part. 
I'm saving the whey into another pan for the next part, because I'll need that to help heat up these curds. And you see the mass of curds coming out here. This is what you get from two gallons of milk. After letting it drain for about 10 minutes, it's time to cheddar the cheese. This involves letting it sit at 102 degrees or so for 60 minutes, being periodically flipped so that the weight of the curds will further draw out moisture and start to knit the curds together in a way that's characteristic of cheddar cheese. I'm doing this in a colander set over the whey that is heated up. Now every recipe says at the end of this process, the curd mash should look kind of like poached chicken. I've never poached chicken before, so I'm kind of assuming that's what this is supposed to look like. Maybe you can tell me in the comments below. Now that the cheese is in a big blob, I need to cut it up into small half inch strips. At this point, if I wanted to, I could just salt these strips and eat them as squeaky cheese curds, and some of them did go that way. But most of them ended up in the bowl to be soaked in beer. The beer that I'm using here to soak the curds in is a bourbon barrel aged imperial stout. It's quite a lovely drink. After soaking in the beer for 45 minutes, I want to drain it off the beer, then add the salt and slowly mill the curds to distribute that salt throughout. If you were to taste it here, the salt would seem a little overbearing. But once you start to press the cheese, the salt will help pull out the whey and some of that salt will work its way out so that the final salt level will be just perfect in here. With that done, it's time to pack the cheese curds into a cheesecloth lined mold. I'm using a large tome mold here, but it didn't quite work right. You'll see the issue I had using this size mold in a little bit. But if I used my smaller mold, I would have had a hard time loading up the full amount of curds that I had had. But in general, once you pack your mold with curds, you pull up the sides of the cheesecloth to make sure it's smooth, and then fold a piece over the top, place the follower on top of that, and then you're off to the cheese press. I'm using a homemade Dutch style cheese press that I picked up on Facebook Marketplace. The recipe calls for eight pounds of pressure for one hour, which I get by putting about three pounds or so out on the edge of the arm. I have a kitchen scale I've used to calibrate how much weight I need to put where to get the final pressure that I need here. You'll also notice I have a pan underneath the mold to catch the whey that's running off. I let it go for an hour, then you need to flip the cheese and press again. Here you see what the cheese looked like at one hour of pressing. Those big gaps are not what I wanted to see. The problem is the follower is a little too big, so it doesn't press all the way down to the bottom of this mold. It works well for three gallons of cheese, but not for two gallons worth. Other cheeses I've done looked a lot better at the one hour point, but I went ahead and flipped it, put the cheesecloth back over the top, added more weight, and let it go overnight. Now it's the next morning, and you can still see that there are lots of gaps left in this cheese. Those gaps are places where mold can get into the cheese, and would definitely prevent me from being able to wax it the way that I wanted to. This really seemed like a serious issue, so I needed to problem solve. What I ended up doing was cutting off some of it so that it could fit into my smaller cheese mold. I just put the smaller mold right on top to see where to cut it and made a small circle out of it. And then I cut up the rest of the pieces place them right on top of it. Increase the weight a little bit more on the mold and let it go for a total of another 12 hours. Here you can see it at about the eight hour mark. I had already flipped it once since I was really curious to see how the curds were knitting together. You can appreciate that there are a lot fewer gaps in it at this point, but it's still probably not quite as smooth as it would have been had I been able to put the right amount of pressure on it from the start. 
So here we are at 12 hours after putting it into the new mold, so about 24 hours altogether of pressing. It certainly looks much better. The next step is to let it air dry for a couple of days. I do this by putting it onto a sanitized sushi mat and covering it with some cheesecloth to keep the bugs off of it. I'll also turn it a few times a day during this time. The last thing I want to do with my cheese after it dries is to wax it. Some of the cheeses I've made I've vacuum sealed, but I wanted to try waxing it for this one. So I'm melting some cheese wax in my cobbled together double boiler here. Now you want to put on generally a couple coats of wax to make sure it's well covered. I've been dipping it in for several seconds and then pull it out and then let it cool down, kind of rotating it along as I go, go around. It was certainly a little slippery holding on to this when I was holding on to the parts that were already waxed, dipping it into the wax. You'll notice that this left a small area in the middle of the cheese on both the top and the bottom. I needed to do some brushing of wax onto it to finish this up. I'm using a natural bristle brush here so that the brush won't melt with the heat of the wax. And I'm doing a couple of coats on both the front side and the back side of the cheese with the brush, trying my best not to burn myself or to make a mess and get banned from the kitchen. And here you see the final product. It needs to age for about six weeks according to the recipe and I have a wine fridge that I use for my cheese cave for this purpose. I have to also flip it over a couple times a week to make sure that it ripens completely according to the recipe.